Chapter 17 of Murder Madness by Murray Leinster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. There was a long pause. Bell was very calm. He seemed to tear his eyes from his writhing hands that were peculiarly sensate, as if under the control of an intelligence alien to his own. I believe, said Bell steadily, that the master wishes to speak to me. With an apparent tremendous effort of will, he thrust his hands into his pockets. Jameson cursed softly. Bell had taken the direction of things entirely out of his hands. It only remained to play up. To be sure, said a mild, benevolent voice, the man with the snowy beard regarded Bell exactly in the fashion of an elderly philanthropist. I am the master, Senor Bell. You have interested me greatly. I have grown to have a great admiration for you. Will you be seated? Your companion also pleases me. I would like... And the mild brown eyes beamed at him. I would like to have your friendship, Senor Bell. Pull out a chair for me, Jameson, said Bell in a strained voice, and I'd like to have a cigarette. Jameson, cursing under his breath, put a chair behind Bell and stuck a cigarette between his lips. He held a match, though his hands shook. You might sit down, too, said Bell steadily. From the manner of the master, I imagine that the conversation will take some time. He inhaled deeply of a cigarette and faced the little man again, and the master looked so benevolent that he seemed absolutely cherubic, and there was absolutely no sign of anything but the utmost saintliness about him. His eyes were clear and mild. His complexion was fresh and translucent. The wrinkles that showed upon his face were those of an amiable and serene soul filled with benevolence and charity. He looked like one of those irritatingly optimistic old gentlemen who habitually carry small coins and stray bits of candy in their pockets for such small children as they may converse with under the smiling eyes of nurses. Ah, Senor Bell, he said gently, you do cause me to admire you. May I see your hands again? Bell held them out. He seemed to have conquered their writhing to some extent, but he could not hold them quite still. Sweat stood out on his forehead. He thrust them abruptly out of sight again. Sad, said the master gently, very sad. He sighed faintly and laid down the rose he had been toying with. His fingers caressed the soft petals delicately. Fortunately, he said benevolently, It is not yet too late for me to relieve the strain under which you labor. Senor, may I send for a certain medicine which will dispose of those symptoms in a very short time? We'll talk first, said Bell harshly. I want to hear what you have to say. The master nodded, his fingers touching the rose petals, as if in a sensitive pleasure in their texture. Always courageous, he said benignly. I admire it while I combat it. But the Senor Jameson... Jameson had been looking fascinatedly at his own hands, opening and closing the fingers with a savage abruptness. They obeyed him, though they trembled. I didn't drink the damn stuff the hotel keeper bought us last night, he growled. Bell did, and I... Wait a minute, Jameson, said Bell evenly. Let's talk to the master for a while. I swore, sir, he said grimly, that I'd kill you. I've seen what your devilish poison does in the hands of the men you've chosen to distribute it. I've seen, he swallowed and said harshly, I've seen enough to make me desire nothing so much as to see you roast in hell. But you wanted to talk to me. Go ahead. The master beamed at him and then glanced about at the frock-coated men who had been attending him. Bell glanced at them. Ribier was there, chuckling. I told you, Tio Mio, he said familiarly, that he would not be polite. You can do nothing with him. Better have him shot. Francia of Paraguay nodded amusedly to Bell as their eyes met, but the master shook his really rather beautiful head. An old man can be good to look at, and with a saintly aureole of snow-white hair and the patriarchal white beard, 
the master was the picture of benign and beautiful old age. Ah, you do not understand, he protested mildly. The more the Senor Bell shows his courage, he o mio, the more we must persuade him. He turned to Bell. I realize, he said gently, that there are hardships connected with the administration of my power, Senor. It is inevitable. But the Latin races of the continent, which is now nearly mine, require strong handling. They require a strong man to lead them. They are comfortable only under despotism. The task I have chosen for you is different, entirely. Los Americanos de Norte will not respond to the treatment which is necessary for those del Sud. Their governments, their traditions, are entirely unlike. If you become my deputy and viceroy for all your nation, you shall rule as you will. A benevolent yet strong rule is needed for your people. It may even be, I will permit it, that the democratic institutions of your nation may continue if you so desire. I am offering you, senor, the position of the absolute ruler of your nation. You may interfere with the present government not at all, if you choose, provided only that my own commands are obeyed when relayed through you. I choose you because you have courage and resource and because you have the Yankee cleverness which will understand your nation and cope with it. Bell inhaled deeply. In other words, he said bitterly, you are saying indirectly that you offer me a chance to be the sort of ruler Americans will submit to without too much fuss, because you think one of Ribiera's stamp would drive them to rebellion. The fine dark eyes twinkled. You have much virtue, senor. My nephew though he is to be my successor, has a weakness for a pretty face. Would you prefer that I give him the task of subduing your nation? You might try it, said Bell. His eyes gleamed. He'd be dead within a week. The master laughed softly. I like you, senor. I do like you indeed. I have not been so defied since another Americano de Norte defied me in the same room. But he had not your resource. He had been enslaved with much less difficulty than yourself. I do not remember what happened to him. He was taken, master, said a fat man with hard eyes, obsequiously. He was taken in Bolivia. It was the man whom Bell had seen earlier that morning in a carriage. You gave him to me. He had insulted me when I ordered him sent to you. I had him killed, but he was very obstinate. Ah, yes, said the master meditatively. You told me the details. He seemed to recall small facts in benevolent retrospection. But you, Senor Bell, I have need for you. In fact, I shall insist upon your friendship, and therefore... He beamed upon Bell. I give you back the Senorita Canaleas. He shook his head reproachfully at the utterly grim look in Bell's eyes. I shall give you one single portion of the antidote to the medicine which makes your hands behave so badly. You may take it when you please. The Senor Jameson I shall keep and enslave. I do not think he will be as obstinate as you are, but he has excellent qualities. If you prove obdurate, I may yet persuade him to undertake certain tasks for me. But you and the Senorita Canaleas are free. Your boat has been reprovisioned and provided with fuel. You may go from here where you will. Ribiere snarled. Tio mio, he protested angrily. You promised me. Your will in many things, said the master gently, but not in all. Remember that you have much to learn, Tio mio. I have taught you to prepare my little medicine, it is true. That is, so you can take my place if age infirmity shall carry me away. The master folded his hands with an air of pious resignation. But you must learn policy. The Senorita Canaleas belongs to the Senor Bell. Jameson was staring now, but Bell's eyes had narrowed to mere slits. You see, said the master gently to him, I desire your friendship. You may go where you will. You may take the Senorita Canaleas with you. 
you will have enough of the antidote to my little medicine to keep you sane for perhaps a week. In one week you may go far with her. You may do many things, but you cannot find a place of safety for her. I have a little power, senor. If you take her with you, your hands will writhe again. Your body will become uncontrollable. Your eyes, staring and horror-struck, will observe your own hands rending her. While your brain is yet sane, you will see this body of yours, which now desires her so ardently, tearing at and crushing that delicate figure, gouging out her eyes, battering her tender flesh, destroying her. Have you ever seen what a man who has taken my little medicine does to a human being at his mercy? The figures about the master were peculiarly tense. The fat man with the hard eyes laughed suddenly. It was a horrible laugh. Francia of Paraguay took out his handkerchief and delicately wiped his lips. He was smiling. Riviera looked at Bell's face and chuckled. His whole gross figure shook with his amusement. And of course, said the master benignly, if you prefer to commit suicide, if you prefer to leave her here, well, my nephew knows little expedience to reduce her will to compliance. You recall Yog, among others? Bell's face was a white mask of horror and fury. He tried to speak and failed. He raised his hand to his throat and tore at the flesh insanely. Let, let me see her, croaked Bell, as if strangling. Jameson stiffened. Bell seemed to be trying to get his hands into his pockets. They were apparently uncontrollable. He thrust them under his coat as there was a stirring at the door. And Paula was brought in, as if she had been waiting. She was entirely colorless, but she smiled at Bell. She came quickly to his side. I heard, she said in a clear and even little voice. We will go together, Charles. If there is a week in which we can be together, it will be so much of happiness. And when you are the master's victim, we will let the little boat sink and sink with it. I do not wish to live without you, Charles, and you do not wish to live as his slave. Bell gave utterance to a sudden laugh that was like a bark. His hands came out from under his coat. Dangling from each one was a small pear-shaped globule of metal. A staff projected upward from each one, and he held those staffs within his writhing hands. About each wrist was a tiny loop of cord that went down to a pin at the base of the staffs. Close to me, Paula, he said coldly. She clung to his arm. He moved forward with a half a dozen revolver muzzles pointed at his breast. If one of you damned fools fires, he said harshly, I'll let go. When I let go, these are Mills' grenades, and they go off in three seconds after they leave the hand. Stand still. There was a terrible, frozen silence, then a movement from behind Bell. Jameson was rising with a grunt. Some day, Bell, he observed coolly, I'll be on to all your curves. This is the best one yet but you're likely to let go at any second, aren't you? Like hell, raged Bell. I drank some of your poison, he snarled at the master. Yes, I was fool enough to do it, but I took what measures any man will take who finds he swallowed poison. I got it out of my stomach at once, and if you or one of these deputies tries to move... Ribiera had blanched to a pasty gray. The master was frozen. But Bell saw Ribiera's eyes move in swift calculation. There was a solid wall behind the master. It seemed as if the greenhouse were a sort of passageway between two larger structures, and there was a door almost immediately behind Ribiera. Ribiera glanced right, left. He flung himself through that door. He knew the secret of the master's power. He was the master's appointed successor. If the master and all his deputies died, Ribiera. But Bell snapped into action like a bent spring released. His arm shot forward. A grenade went hurling through the door through which Ribiera had fled. There was an instantaneous, terrific explosion. The solid wall shook and shivered, 
and with a vast deliberation collapsed. The greenhouse was full of crushed plaster dust. Panes of glass shivered. But Bell was upon the master. He had struck the little man down and stood over him, his remaining automatic replacing the grenade he had thrown. Ribiera is dead, he snapped, and if I'm shot, the master dies too, and you all go mad. Stand back. The deputies stood frozen. I think, said Jameson, composedly, I'll take a hand now. I'll pick him up, Bell. Right, I've got him, with a grenade hanging down his back. If he jerks away from me or I from him, it will blow his spine to bits. Hold him so, said Bell coldly. He went coolly to where he could look over the heap of the collapsed wall. He saw a bundle of torn clothing that had been a man. It was flung against a cracked and tottering chimney. Right, he said evenly. Ribier is dead, all right. He turned to the deputies, whose revolvers were still in their hands. The master's carriage, please, he said politely, to the door. You may accompany us, if you please, but in other carriages. I am working for the release of all the master's slaves, and you among them, if you choose, but you can see very easily that there is no hope for the release of the master without the meeting of my terms. The master spoke softly and mildly and without fear. It is my order that the senor bell is to be obeyed. I shall return. You need have no fear of my death. My carriage. A man went stiffly, half paralyzed with terror, to where the chattering garret servants were grouped in the awful fear that came upon the slaves of the master at any threat to his rule. But Bell and Paula and Jameson went slowly and cautiously, though they held the whip hand, to the entrance door of the house and out to the entrance gate. A carriage was already before the door when they reached it, and others were drawing up in a line behind it. Get in, said Bell briefly, down to the waterfront. He turned to the group of frock-coated, stricken men who had followed. Some of you men, he said coldly, had better go on ahead and warn the police and the public generally about the certainty of the master's death if any attempt is made to rescue him. Francia of Paraguay summoned a swagger and raised his hand to the second carriage. It drew into the curb. I will attend to it, Senor Bell, he said politely. Ah, when I think that I once raised my revolver to shoot you and refrained. He drove off swiftly. Bell's eyes were glowing. He got into the carriage, and such a procession drove through the streets of Punta Arenas as had rarely moved through the streets of any city in the world. The long line of carriages moved at a funeral pace amid a surging, terrified mob. The master being placidly as he looked out over the white, starkly agonized faces. Some of the people groaned audibly. A few cursed the master in their despair. More cursed Bell, not daring to strike or fire on him. But he would have been torn to bits if he had stepped from the carriage for an instant. Bell, said Jameson dryly, considering that I am prepared to be blown apart on three seconds' notice, it is peculiar that this mob frightens me. The master's eyes twinkled benignly. He seemed totally insensible to fear. You need not be afraid, he said gently. They will not touch you unless I order them. Jameson stared down at the little man whose collar he held firmly, with a mill's grenade dangling down at the back of his neck. I wouldn't order them to attack if I were you, he said coldly. I haven't Bell's brains, but I have just as much dislike for you as he has. They came to the harbor. Bell spoke again. The carriage is to drive out to the end of one of the docks, and no one else is to go out on that dock. The master relayed the order in his mild voice, but as the coachman obeyed him, he clucked his tongue commiseratingly. Senor Bell, he protested gently, you do not expect to escape, not after killing me. Why, that is absurd. Bell said nothing. He alighted from the carriage, his face set grimly, 
and stared ashore at the long, long row of terrified faces staring out at him. The whole waterfront seemed to be lined with staring faces. Wails came from the mass of enslaved human beings. Hold him here, Jameson, he said drearily. I'm going out to look at that big plane. There's a rowboat tied to the dock here. He swung down the side into the dock and rowed off into the harbor, while the horses attached to the master's carriage pawed impatiently at the wooden flooring of the dock. Bell reached the two planes anchored on the still harbor water. The smaller one had brought them down from Buenos Aires. The larger one had gone after the beached amphibian and brought it and Paula on to the city. Bell, from the shore, was seen to be investigating the larger one. He came rowing back. His head appeared above the dock edge. All right, he said tiredly. The master has a rule requiring all his ships ready for instant flight. Very useful. The big plane is fueled and full of oil. We'll go out to it and take off. Jameson lifted the master to his feet and with a surge of muscles swept him down to the flooring of the dock. Paula first, said Bell, and then the master, and then you, Jameson. One moment, said the master reproachfully. It would be cruel not to let me reassure my subjects. I will give an order. Bell and Jameson listened suspiciously, but he spoke gently to the coachman. You will tell the deputies, said the master in Spanish, that a month's supply of medicine for all my subjects will be found in my laboratory, and you may tell them that I shall return before the end of that time. The coachman's eyes filled with a passionate relief. Now, said the master placidly, I am ready for our little jaunt. Paula descended the ladder and seated herself in the bow of the boat. Bell covered the master grimly with his automatic as he descended. With surprising agility, Jameson came down last and resumed his former grip on the master's collar. Bell rode out to the big plane. Jameson kept close watch while Bell started the four huge motors and throttled them down to warming up speed while he hauled up the anchor with which the huge seaplane was anchored. The dock was covered with a swarm of panic-stricken folk. Everywhere, all the inhabitants of the city, who were slaves to the master, had come in awful terror to watch, and all the inhabitants of the city were slaves to the master. Some of them fell to their knees and held out imploring arms to Bell, begging him for mercy and the return of the master. Some cursed wildly. But with his jaws set grimly, Bell gave the motors the gun. The big plane moved heavily, then more swiftly through the water. It lifted slowly and rose and rose and dwindled to a speck high in the air. And all through the streets and ways of Punta Arenas, fear stalked almost as a tangible thing. Panic hovered over the housetops always ready to descend. Terror was in the air that every man breathed, and every human being looked at every other human being with staring, haunted eyes. Punta Arenas was waiting for its murder madness to begin. End of Chapter 17